this is the topic of our last section, uh, solving of conic optimization problems. Um, well, the dual oftentimes enables us to uh, solve parts of our problem in, in closed form or to, to speed up the algorithms. And for the conic optimization problems, oftentimes we have a very nice dual. Yeah, and, and the nice dual helps us a lot. And uh, for this we need the definition of the dual cone. And uh, a dual cone is defined as, well, taking my primal cone uh, K, then the dual cone K star, it consists of all the vectors S, um, where the inner product of S and X is greater than zero for any X from the original kernel K. Yeah. So, um, if something is in my dual kernel, that means that for every element of the original kernel, the inner product with this S will be positive. And uh, if the original cone K is closed and convex, then if I apply this dualizing a second time, I will exactly recover the original K. And uh, for us, even more interesting, the cones that we were looking at, so the nice cones, the, the uh, non-negative orthant and the second order cone and the semi-definite cone, they are self-dual, meaning that they have exactly themselves as the dual cones. And that's perfect because we have a closed form solution for the dual cone, we don't have to do anything, they are their own dual cone. Uh, and this is one of the big reasons why these three are so popular and why we have fast solution methods for them. Okay, now we have dual cones, but uh, what is actually the dual then of a conic optimization problem? So here we have the, the canonical definition of a, a conic optimization problem. And uh, what we simply do is we, we, we produce the Lagrangian of that. So here we have the Lagrangian uh, supremum over lambda, infimum over x, and here uh, this, uh, this infimum, uh, it gives rise to our Lagrangian dual, Q of lambda, uh, for which we then later want to take the supremum. Okay. And uh, we can write that down. So uh, here we have our Lagrangian and uh, uh, Lagrangian dual. And uh, what we can do is we can pull out um, lambda transposed times b, we can pull it out in front because it doesn't depend on x. Uh, so we can just pull it out in front. And what remains then here is well some constant plus this uh, second part. And for this second part, this uh, there we take the infimum of x. And now we have two possibilities. Um, our x needs to be here in, in, in our cone. And um, now we have two possibilities. So either this guy here, it goes to minus infinity or it goes to zero. Uh, so here, it's, uh, here it's, 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 it's a binary decision. So either it goes to minus infinity or it goes to zero. And it will go exactly to zero when this guy in here is in the dual cone. So um, this guy here, I'm calling it S. And if this guy in S is in the dual cone, then from the definition of the dual cone, I know that the lowest I can get by multiply or by taking the inner product here of X and S will be zero. And if this guy here is not in the dual cone, then it, uh, the infimum will, will go off and, and go to minus infinity. Okay, and uh, this has been written down here. So here this is the, this is this case distinction. And uh, because uh, exact, actually for the Lagrangian here, we also have this supremum in front, the supremum over lambda. We know that we don't like the minus infinity case and we always prefer the case where here we end up with lambda transpose b. Hence, we know that s, so this guy here or this guy here, this s, we know that this s 
has to be in the dual column. Okay, and now we can write the whole thing uh, as a, a dual conic program. So uh, we are uh, maximizing here over B transposed uh, lambda. Subject here that our S is in the um, is in the dual column. Wait a sec. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And uh, so this is just a little bit rewritten here, um, but uh, it's exactly the same statement. Okay. So now from um, the primal conic program, um, I can get to the dual conic program, and for the um, and for the cones we're looking at, the non-negative orthant, the second order cone, and the semi-definite programming. Um, I don't have to do anything at all or much at all because here they are self-dual and um, I have a closed form solution to get to the to the to the to the dual core. Okay, so this was one of the first ideas. The the second big idea is to do projection. To say I have my cone and I might end up with some solution that is outside of the cone. And what then is the, the projection on the cone? So that here I have uh, the, the, the minimum distance from my original point to the point on the cone. So this is strongly related to the, to the projection that we've seen already on, on vector spaces. But here we don't project on, on a vector space, we project on a cone. And for the positive definite orthant, uh, or for the, for the non-negative positive orthant, uh, it's really easy because I just maximize all the elements of my vector x individually. And for the second order cone and the semi-definite cone, there are also closed form solutions. Please don't remember the formula. The formula are too complicated for the exam. Uh, but, well, there is a closed form solution for the second order cone and also for the semi-definite cone, and for the semi-definite cone it in involves this um, eigenvalue decomposition that we already have seen a couple of times in, in previous lectures. Okay, so again the cones we are looking at are nice and uh, we have closed form solutions to, to do the projection. And um, um, oftentimes we not only want to project on the cone, but we have these additional equality constraints. So for the primal problem here, we had our cone and we had an additional uh, equality constraint. The same for the dual problem. We had our cone and we have our additional equality constraint. And um, it might be difficult to do the projection on the intersection. So I have here somehow P, which is the set of points that uh, hold this uh, affine equality constraint, and I have my cone K. Uh, and now I want to look at all the points that are in the intersection of uh, K and P. And doing that projection might be much more involved. So what we do is we split it up and we alternate between the projections. So we have our first point and we first project that here on the affine constraints. Then we take that point and we project it on the, on the cone. Then we take that point, we project it back on the affine constraints and so on and so on. And I could do that just in that, um, in just that order. Um, but there's an additional trick uh, coming from, from Dijkstra not the computer science Dijkstra, this is the mathematics Dijkstra. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, there's uh, an addition called Dijkstra's correction, which is here line 5 of the algorithm. And what Dijkstra's correction gives me is that actually doing this um, projection, this alternating projection in a loop, it will bring me to a point that is actually the, the closest point to the original one sitting in the intersection of K and P. And otherwise I might end up, if I don't have this uh, correction, I might up, end up with another point that is in the um, intersection as well, 
but uh, more difficult to characterize a priori what, what, what that means. Okay, so now we have looked at the projection, but uh, oftentimes we want to do the optimization. So we want to do an optimization over all points in the projection. And uh, we can do that as well by this alternating idea. So what we do is we split uh, or we generate two equal variables. So before we were optimizing over x and now we are optimizing over x and y with an equality constraint. So I, I'm, I'm optimizing my x over the cone and I'm optimizing my y over my uh, set P of the uh, feasible solutions for the Fn constraints. And here I require the two to be equal, which effectively means I uh, am constraining to the points on the intersection of, of K and P. And now we have here Fx plus G of X, but we could also here have, uh, let's say, one half F of X plus one half F of Y, which would recover the original problem before we did the splitting into the two variables, but um, there are also many techniques that, that abuse this splitting up where I have different F and different J and uh, there's a whole um, uh, research community um, looking at uh, these alternating methods and they are highly, highly successful. Um, so, but with this problem, with the split up variables, we can define an augmented Lagrangian where we uh, optimize over the f and over the g and here we have our equality constraint for x and y to be equal with the Lagrangian multiplier lambda and uh, in order to get some additional curvature we apply this idea of the augmented Lagrangian we had already seen that in lecture 5 so we add some additional curvature here um, with a hyperparameter rho and uh, this is actually equivalent because it doesn't change the position of the optimizer. It just gives us more curvature. And uh, now for solving this Lagrangian here, we can also use this alternating idea where I say, well, first of all, I am optimizing the X and keeping the Y fixed. Then I'm optimizing over the Y and keeping the X fixed. And then I am finally adjusting the, the lambda and I make the Lagrange multiplier stronger or I make it more, I give it more weight uh, if the X and the Y are growing further apart. And you see a really close correspondence. So you see a really close correspondence also, also in the formula between here this alternating projection and the alternating Lagrangian approach and this is a topic that goes really deep and you can have a look at this paper by, by Boyd if you're interested in that. Um, so these two formulas, also not relevant for the exam, however, they give you an understanding how today we are solving these very, very high dimensional conic problems uh, and, and do it fast because we split it up into easy to solve sub problems that we then solve in, in an alternating fashion. Um, the last idea for solving conic optimization problems is to translate this idea of the logarithmic barrier uh, so that we can also use the interior point method. So the interior point method was that, uh, well, I have um, here some, some constraint and I'm only looking at values that are, uh, well, maybe larger here than some, some fixed uh, value. And uh, there is this logarithmic barrier and by, by choosing an appropriate scaling of the logarithmic barrier, I can make that look rather close to the indicator function. Uh, but that only worked for um, here um, individual scalar inequality constraints or the output of the GI here would be, would be a scalar number. Uh, and now we want to use the same also for the cones. And uh, for the three cones, we have, well, nice, again, barrier functions. So for the non-negative orthant, it's what we would expect. It's just the sum over the, uh, the individual logarithms. And then 
well, I, I invert that, put a minus in front, so that the, the, the barrier actually goes up. For the second order column, it's a little bit more involved here, then I'm comparing the T uh, to the uh, to the to, to the u and uh, the this is exactly from 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 the definition of the second order cone that t has to be larger than the Euclidean norm of, of u and for the semi-definite cone uh, here I'm taking the negative logarithm of the determinant uh, so here this um, uh, this notation here this is the determinant of of the matrix x and I take the negative logarithm of that. Okay, so for our nice cones, again, we have a nice formula for, for the barriers, and um, um, this is then used, for example, in uh, this alternating directions method from the previous slide, where I'm uh, then solving, for example, here this minimization problem for all y elements sum k, um, and uh, then I can use the interior point method to solve this particular subproblem. Okay, and uh, there's um, still the question of how um, do we scale um, the barrier, how fast do we make the barrier tight, and um, well here I refer to Nesterov, um, the, the theory of self-concordant barriers uh, is developed um, um, pretty far for for uh, conic programming, but it's uh, a little bit too advanced for, for this course here. Uh, you only need to know that for, for, for these cones, we know how to scale up the barrier as fast as we can uh, and still uh, solve the individual iterations um, uh, to get for, for a particular scalier, scaling to here the, 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 the minimum um, as fast as possible. So these um, um, algorithms work quite well. There are also primal dual algorithms for conic programming that uh, work quite well. Um, so we can solve optimization problems up to thousands of um, thousands of um, dimensions. Where okay for the semi-definite cone it's thousands of dimensions, and for the second order and uh, non-negative orphans it's it's more more tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dimensions uh, which we can still solve. Um, I would ra however recommend that you use existing libraries. So these are the important ideas and knowing about these is also helping you in constructing optimization problems and maybe debugging issues that come up when you are working on, on practical problems but um, there have been so many many years of effort put into the available solvers that if you are not doing a PhD in optimization use one of the readily available libraries when you're working with with conic optimization problems and uh, you will get uh, state-of-the-art there's open source solutions that work quite well there are also commercial packages um, and um, optimization is, is uh, uh, helping in, in many many practical applications um, and it's also interesting, um, and if you're interested in the subject, please go and write your own solvers. Um, but if it's uh, for, for in some commercial setting, usually don't waste your time. Use one of the readily available libraries. Okay, so what have we learned today? We saw how convex cones give rise to these hierarchies of, of um, optimization problems that get more and more difficult and more and more difficult also to solve. Um, we saw some nice cones from this hierarchy, uh, positive author and second order cone, semi-definite cone, and um, they have um, uh, good definitions for their dual and we have good uh, barrier functions defined for them. So uh, uh, not only do they cover many interesting applications, but we can also solve them efficiently. And uh, we saw some of the concepts for efficient solving. Uh, so duality, Lagrangian duality for cones, um, projecting points onto a cone, alternating methods where we are solving uh, individual subproblems that and uh, where we can solve the subproblems more efficiently than the overall problem, and then we alternate between the subproblems, 
and uh, last but not least the, the barrier functions for uh, cone inequalities to be used in, in the interior part method. That's it for the, today. See you next week and next week will be the last lecture. Next week will be on non-convex optimization to wrap this course up.